All right, today is the day. It is pitch day. And so I am really, really excited. Again, I want to thank Angela and Tracy and them and Jen and Tiffany, all those who um, had the pleasure of working with as part of this online session. It has been great. So I want to thank Tom uh, Webster for paving the way and um, really excited about these pitch participants and the opportunity um, that they're going to have today to share their amazing businesses. So, are we ready? Is our timer queued up? Um, I want to uh, really quickly, I want to introduce our three judges um, to say hello and the organization for businesses that they're from. I'll start with uh, Gary Johnson. He's waving. Kelly Lee from Backstage Capital. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much. And Scott Fishman from Robinson Ventures. Thank you, Scott. I see Alan Weber on the line as well. Thank you, Alan, for coming. And so we're ready to get started. So uh, in the words of that great uh, family feud host, give me Dismo. Give me Sisters Original Supreme Prize. Let's get it on. Let's go. All right, well, hi everyone. I'm Michael Stauffer, I'm founder of Bismu, where we think that serious therapy can be seriously fun. The topic we're talking about today is movement therapy for neuroatypical children. So kids from age five to 18, sometimes 21, depending on the, uh, on the diagnoses and what state you're in even. Uh, this is, means kids with autism, ADHD, and other kinds of sensory integration challenges. And in the US, there's about 6 million kids who can benefit from these kinds of movement therapies. The, it's important for building critical life skills. These neurological trainings underpin things such as learning how to dress yourself, how to read and write, and even social communication, socialization. These are really critical for kids' growth and, and ability to sort of function in the world more on their own. There we go. Oh, no. Come back. Oh, yeah. So traditionally, this is a very hands-on process. So you have to be there with the client, working with them, and uh, comes kind of tedious in that way. And it's highly repetitive. It's like doing exercise or a ther physical therapy for yourself. You have to do a lot of these repetitions to make it worthwhile and effective. Now, the problem with all this is that everyone struggles with it. The kids get bored. It gets monotonous. Uh, the therapist can really focus only on one kid at a time most of the time, so it's very inefficient in that sense. And parents, even though they want to do this with their kids at home, it's very important to do that to get the full effect of the of therapies. It's just too difficult for them to do it practically, either time-wise or skill-wise. This all leads to worse outcomes for the kids. And the need then is for engaging tools that you can effectively give movement therapy benefits to the, to the kids and to the clients in general and for independence through some of these tools. The solution that we have here is called Groove Catcher. It's a movement and creative arts therapy program in virtual reality. See that little animation in there? The basic idea is you're following flowing lines through space, you're smashing cubes, and it leads you through these uh, movement therapy practices. Now, this is driven by therapist demand. This project started as a game, and we were showing it around, and the therapist said, I want to use this with my clients, and they told me how and why. So it's specialized, our particular uh, target right now is specialized for the neurotypical populations and their movement therapy needs, and it's customizable by the therapist for particular music they want to do or even particular kind of movements. It's easy then to make their own tracks or levels that the, their clients can use them. And it's all available to work on off-the-shelf, inexpensive hardware. It's easy to use. It's about $300 to get started with this. With, for this kinds of therapy practices, it's actually pretty inexpensive. Uh, the top benefits, just to sort of review again, it's fun, leads to more engagement, better outcomes for the kids. Movement, um, so motivating home use is critical, like you mentioned, better outcome for the kids again. And then this is just makes it easier for the therapists and the parents. You know, therapists can work probably two, three, maybe four kids at once, and they can do things in group that they wouldn't necessarily do as well before. So overall, the competition here, we're really competing against traditional therapies, and some of these technology-based therapies that are using desktop and 2D technologies. So the main thing is like really fun. So traditional therapy is rarely traditional fun. 
some of these desktop ones have some game components, but I haven't seen any that are like really fun, like really a game. Uh, it's fully immersive. The therapists love this because in virtual reality, you're using your full depth perception, using your appropriate perception is getting coordinated with the music input. It's a, I should say it's a very musical game. All the moves are dance based. So you're getting this multi-sensory coordination training that the therapists really love. And user generated content, individual and group sessions are important and immersive telehealth. So you can work immersively with another client here in VR and you can be in session with them, so to speak, using an avatar. And this has great advantages for people who live far from therapists, uh, specialists that uh, best help them. So I'm running a patent that uh, covers some of the uses that we're developing for this. That's in process. Overall in phase one, to start with, we're gonna look at B2B. It's about 220,000 therapists in schools who can use this. Special education in schools is a very important avenue. A lot of kids get their therapy just from special education. They can be supported by grants from foundations and they have separate budgeting process. So it's a little easier to get into this than it is for traditional school, uh, school purchases. Uh, FDA approval is not needed. So this, a lot of people ask about this. Therapists can use whatever tool they want that they think is useful for their goals and the billing and so on goes by what they do in a general sense, not by what tools they use. Uh, the marketing is pretty straightforward. Of course, it's gonna take some effort, but therapists learn at expos, they learn from professional organizations and learn from word of mouth. So there's gonna be a lot of networking involved in getting, in getting attention around this. We're looking at a subscription model for professional, about maybe $750 a year on average, we're still working that out. And this works out to a TAM at about 165 million. The SAM is the same because it's software, so we can service everyone. In phase two, so once we've established the B2B market, we want to go for a consumer market. This is the 6 million neurotypical kids who can benefit from, benefit from this home use. Now they're going to get uh, referred this, this referred to them by their therapists and their teachers from the schools. And then we're looking, <clears throat> excuse me, another subscription model more affordable for home use, maybe $180 a year or so. And overall, this gives a TAM of a billion dollars. Time. Okay. Should I stop? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> I babbled too much at the beginning. Uh, okay. I'm doing field tests next month. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll now have five minutes for the judges to ask questions. I can start. Um, great job. My question is, could you walk us through the timeline that you're working with here? I see um, essentially in November things are, are kicking off. Could you walk us through that? Yeah, sure. So I'm finishing up an MVP. Uh, to, that I can put into the hands of the therapist. It's using this easy to use hardware. Sort of, the software already works in one platform. Getting it to that platform is the one I can use with the therapist. So I have a couple dozen or more therapists and clinics that want to try this out. And so we'll do some pilot studying with them, get some feedback, try to get some of them signed up as early customers. Um, and then at the same time over the fall and winter, we're going to start up a pilot study with Drexel University. They're actually interested in dementia because there's a lot of overlap between these kinds of tools and populations. And SBIR is interesting, starting either with Drexel University, sort of probably next summer, or on my own. There's, there's SBIRs targeted for special education, which can be uh, you know, very applicable to this since it's a new technology project. It's great for SBIR. Michael, interesting presentation. Um, my biggest question is what do you mean when you say butter outcomes and how are you going to demonstrate that to, sure. uh, to attract therapists? Well, in the short term, the therapists I talk to, it's like they don't even need to see research. This is, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. They say, all right, I get it. They know all about movement therapy. They buy different kinds of tools all the time to reach their movement therapy goals. So they see this, or they, I even just tell, about, tell them about it in person. They, and sometimes they never see it. And they say, oh yeah, I get it. Kids love video games. This can guide them through different movement therapies. If they love it and they don't think they're doing therapy, I want to use it. So that's the short term. In the longer term, I'm very interested in science. I have a science background, and that's part of what we're studying with Drexel University. Even though that's for um, dementia, there's a lot of overlap, and I'm also interested in further studies for uh, movement therapy in general, in particular for the uh, neurodiversity community. Can you um, tell us a bit about your um, IP that you, that you said that you're doing um, patent? 
A patent? Yeah. So I'm developing a patent, not for the general uh, approach, but for a particular intervention that I'm developing with a dance therapist. I didn't um, show that on my team, but I'm working with a dance therapist who has been advising me on the, she, she specializes in the neuroatypical population. And she's been advising me and helping me develop the actual interventions. And then one of them is this more complex tool that is going to help with building the basically the neural developmental funding blocks uh, of social communication. So it's, it's a little hard to explain briefly, but there's sort of there's things you can do with movement therapy that can in reinforce skills or build skills that are critical for even being able, for example, to look someone in the eye and to mirror someone's movements. And so she's been working on these ideas with me and using the software, we have a particular process that we're gonna take kids through to uh, lead them in, in, to grow in this direction. I, I don't know if there's an, another question, but I would like to know your um, go to market strategy after your pilot, after that. That's a really good question. I'm not really sure about yet either. So I'm, I'm trying to get through the pilot and then get more advice on go to market. But my, in terms of the very first market, it's a lot of networking. I meet people, talk to them about what they need in their practice. So after that, need some more research. But I know, for example, early expos will be part of like the marketing part of it. And the, the, the software will develop during the whole process. It's like these Therapists are really itching for something and it doesn't need to be all perfect for them to, to even start using it or to see benefits from it. So it's evolving. I can't really give you much more detailed answer than that. This is a comment more than a question, but I would encourage you along the same line to really dig down, not wait until you've got your pilot and so forth. You need to have a plan in place uh, if you're going to attract interest and investment. Okay. Thirty seconds left for questions. Are there any other questions from our judges? All right. If not, uh, Michael, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. We're moving on to Nefertari Kali. With uh, Sister's original supreme eyes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet, but you should yet. be able to share it. Um, okay, hold on. Let me go back here and let me go to, wait a minute, where do I share it at? Where do I go to share? So the green share screen button on the bottom, if you click that, and then you should click whichever screen you have open with your presentation. That should do the trick. Oh, got it. Go to presentation. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, I got it. All right, you ready? Go to presentation. Go to the top. Go to the top. Go all the way up. Wait a minute. Go where? Go all the way up to where it says where it says slideshow. Hold on one second. Slideshow. Hold on. I'm trying to find. Okay, I see it. Slideshow. Yes. Now what? Start. Start. That's it. There you go. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is um, Nefitari. Um, also go by and I also go by the name of Lauren Holly. Um, hold on one second. I can't see my screen. Let me let me change this around a little bit. Okay. All right. So we are Sisters Original Supreme Pies. <laughs> Sisters of Original Supreme Pies, so good you ain't gonna to wanna to share. The legacy, the vision. 25, excuse me, I am an entrepreneur of 20 years and I'm also a business, I mean, also into business management for the past 30 years. I've always had a passion for business and I've also wanted to leave a legacy for my children. The opportunity presented itself through a summer youth program my children attended. The children were given seed money to create a business. 
and we came up with Sisters Original Supreme Pies. As you see here, we have four different pies. We have a classic bean, a butternut squash, queen bean, and a 24 karat pie. As time went on, as we progressed, the pies were entered in contests. We entered in a contest, which you see we won five times. Also our pies were featured at the Art Museum here in Philadelphia. And also our pies um, came in first place, the best bean pie in Philadelphia. The global bake, the, excuse me, the global bakery product market size is expected to reach 251 billion by, the, by 2025. Our milestones. Our pies are in the process of going on the shelves of a major supermarket, which is called ShopRite. ShopRite has 12 stores, which we are so totally excited about putting these pies on the shelves. The goal for 2021 is to host pop-up events at all of the shop rights. 2022, the, our goal is to actually establish distribution with all the shop right locations, to hire in 2023, to hire staff, and to 2024, the ultimate goal is to purchase a state of the art commercial kitchen and storefront. Quick comparison, we are different by design. Why are we different? Because our pies are homemade and wholesome. Our revenue model, as you can see, profit margin is 96%. Our team, this is my family. My daughter um, is the project manager and my son is the operational manager. The use of the funds, as you can see here, what we need is equipment. We would like to also um, create our website and launch it and use the funds also for advertisement. Thank you. Remember, this is original Supreme Pie, so good you ain't gonna wanna share. For allowing the other two judges who are with us, that did bring some ties for you. So, uh, Gary, make sure you bring that in. That is. So, if you would like, we'll figure out a way to get it to you. Um, but I want to cut the four or five judges for some comments and questions if you like. Let me start, Nefertari. Um, you're, you, you gave sort of a global um, market um, estimate. W what do you think the, uh, you only participate in a, in a small segment of that. What do you think the actual size of the opportunity is here? Um, and w along with that, um, what kind of distribution would you expect to have over the next three years? I mean, is it just local in Philadelphia or are you going to be beyond that? Okay, I'm going to answer the, the last question. Um, I plan the goals is to actually tap into the whole United States. That's what I would like to do. Um, over the next three years, no, that's not going to happen like that. I want to say maybe five years um, distribution um, in restaurants, distribution in, in Targets, um, Walmarts, um, uh, Whole Food Markets. So that's what, when it comes to the distribution, um, could you repeat the first question again, please? Um, I'm just interested in what you think your actual um, total addressable market is um, for pies. I mean, you gave sort of a global figure, if I remember it was 250 billion or something, but I mean, you participate in a relatively small segment of that. I'd like to know what you, what you think your market opportunity is. Oh, and, and if I can tack on another piece, uh, another small question, I'm, I'm really interested in how you got into ShopRite. How did I get into ShopRite? Yeah. Um, actually, how I got into ShopRite was through um, uh, word of mouth 
And I actually went through a, a, a incubator, Brown Shop, right, an incubator program. And what they did was they actually um, walked us through the whole process. So what they do is that they focus on small um, local businesses and help you through the process to your success. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what were the what were the results um, in Shoprite again? I don't know if you mentioned it. If I missed it, yeah, it's kind of choppy. What were the results that you got from Shoprite going the results after after going through their accelerator? I, I don't know if an accelerator, but their program. Like, what did you get out of it? Okay, what it is is that we are not actually in Shoprite yet. There's a process that we have to go through. The process is having a pop up event. So once we have the pop up event, we will actually see what the turnout is like. So once we do that, the goal is to actually um, go to each um, shop right each week and put the pies, I mean, and let the people try the pies. And the goal is to actually um, focus on one store at a time until we master each store. So the first store we go into, we're actually, the goal is to put the pies on the shelves. So as people are trying the pies, they have a, 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 a central location, they can purchase the pies um, from until the pies um, are on the shelves at the store in their community. Could you uh, share a little bit about your revenue to date and sort of when and where you currently sell your pies? Okay, the revenue to date as we speak um, is about maybe $500 a month, all right? The pies are in um, a local restaurant here in West Philadelphia. Um, actually, I wanna say two local restaurants here in Philadelphia at the moment. And how long have you been in business? I've been in business for seven years. Awesome. Can you share which restaurants you're in? Yes, I can. Um, Sides Restaurants with is on 44th and um, Walnut. And the other restaurant there at Gigi's um, on 60th and Haverford. Well, I, I've tried uh, one out of four of the pies that you gave uh, to each of us judges. So thank you very much. The 24 karat is delicious. Thank you. All right, let's give back to your repertory around the applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Put hands together for Sam and Oh, he's there? Yeah. Oh, you want to do one? Yeah. He is in France, so. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, do you want to run the slides or do you want me to run them? Can you hear me? Are you, are you? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah, I can run them. Um, if it's possible for you to do it though, um, yeah, it might come a little bit cleaner, uh, uh, clearer through, but I, I definitely can if needed. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, just so you know, it's not over the video. Sure. We're good. 
Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Sam. And I am Cole Hainer. And uh, together we make Politic. Um, Politic is set out on a mission to re-engage the citizenry uh, with our democracy. So the opportunity. Um, there's a growing distrust in the political institutions of today, the media, uh, as well as throughout the internet. Uh, as you can see, there's very little trust in TV news, Congress, a growing distrust in the Supreme Court. And 74% of Americans think that their, uh, the spread of misinformation is plaguing our country. So the problem, um, we think the current communication between civilians and politicians drastically needs to change. Uh, there's lack of direct civilian vocalization on issues. Um, there's a lack of information and where to get it uh, with politicians and their actions. And in a 2018 study, 60% of people said because there's so many sources and they don't know what to believe, they think it's actually harder to access governmental information. So that led us to the solution. So yeah, the solution is politics. Politic is a mobile application currently in development that will be free. And basically just how it works is users sign up and they enter their zip code in and they are able to see their local, state and federal representatives and the tax rates for each tier as well. And a summary of bills and current and past bills that includes. The key feature though with Politic is that users are actually able to do live voting on current bills and politicians and the tax rates. They can voice their opinion, yes or no, if they like it or not. And it's all based on facts, it's anonymous. And you can see people in your community and how they feel about the same issues that you're concerned about. So we did conduct some market research. Uh, we made a survey monkey and we got 56 people to respond. Uh, we asked people when they see an approval rating, how they actually feel about it, because we see them all the time on the news. And the one takeaway we got was 7% of people actually said that they do trust the results. Um, and then we also asked people, because obviously the trends are tied to mainstream media, would you rather just see a summary of bills from the .gov websites? And overwhelmingly, 7% of people said they would prefer that. So our targeted customer then with that said is anyone between 18 and 30, um, just at first, because you know it's a mobile app, it's a lot easier to access them. And start in Philadelphia, you know, just a very focused marketing, it's easier to reach people, you know, local traction. And the good thing about it is if we took this uh, survey as well uh, for people to take, and we got the, the fact that people, if they're actually politically active and they feel like they're heard, they're gonna keep wanting to do it. So we'll have a lot of customer retention. So competitors, we did find one competitor. They're also locally based, actually. Uh, it's called TIP, Transparency in Politics. They're more focused on a uh, dashboard for elected officials to see constituent sentiment. The reason we're different is because we're not waiting for the elected officials to care about constituent sentiment. We want to allow the citizenry to get engaged right away. And there still will be a method to contact the politicians phone, by phone, email, et cetera. But that's a little bit of our competitors and how we're different. So, you know, we're a business at the end of the day. So this is how we're actually going to make money. At first, it's pretty obvious advertisements in app. Uh, we gave some numbers, the averages. And if we had 10,000 users per month, uh, this is what we came up with. Um, secondly, we get a cut of the generated external revenue. So in app, if there's a, if anyone wants to make a donation to a campaign or an activist group, we just take a small percentage cut of that donation. And lastly, we're going to act at the end of the day as a data brokerage. We're going to have all this data on how people feel and general information about people. And we can sell that privately to companies. And you know, we strip all the personal information away from that, obviously. It's just the demographics of uh, the users and nothing that can track back to them. So I'm the co-founder and CEO. Um, I'm a law student at Drexel currently. And I actually wrote my thesis in college about Supreme Court decisions over time and public sentiment and public opinion. So this is a natural progression for me. And I'm also the co-founder and I'm the CTO. Um, I made multiple mobile applications and the consulting on them as well. And I recently worked uh, with MIT and IBX uh, for machine learning. And lastly, use of funds, we place this competition. Uh, we wanna grow our development team, um, also expand our marketing so we can get more users for our app. Um, we wanna cover any outstanding legal fees and do an in-depth copyright trademark search. And lastly, cover any operational costs for our website and business accounts. 
So yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Um, if you want to go on our website and sign up for the newsletter or check out our social media, uh, they're right here and we're open to any questions, feedback. And again, thank you. Thank you for listening. It was uh, really appreciate being here and for everyone taking their time out of their day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll start with my first one. Um, who are these businesses that you're planning on selling the user data to? Um, yeah, to talk to that's, that's a good. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good question. So there are um, businesses out there. They're just data brokers itself. Um, they can take your data, and they have the connections already that you're able to sell them to. But they require like a lot of users at first. They don't just take any company with data. Um, but most data brokerage in the United States is usually is business to business. So we would have to reach out or they would reach out to us, their uh, sales team, uh, you know, for campaigns, for politicians, for news outlets, you know, just different news websites. And they target their ads and stuff um, to specific customers. And we would give them the data to know who to target it to. So if they have liberal media, they might want to send it only to liberals. Um, it doesn't, you know, conservatives usually don't click on that kind of stuff as much. So that data... Um, is at $20 billion a year uh, right now in the US just from for that information alone, uh, just total market size, so. I'm, I'm just wondering like, if you do that, like how does that help the current political situation we have in our country? Uh, well, if it just um, in general, you know, people first off, they'll be able to hear their, you know, they'll say to their politician, you know, hey, this is how we actually feel. And eventually down the road, we want to get politicians on the app too, and you let them use this to see what people really want to hear and what they want. Um, in terms of the data though, um, you know, campaigns, they will we'll be able to give a map of like, hey, this is where people don't like you. And this is where you should maybe go. And, you know, more connectivity and like they are able to speak there and because um, some people just aren't informed, really. So they'll know where to go. They'll know where to target what they want to say. And hopefully, you know, in the end, it does help that. This seems to me to be extremely intensive on the back end. I mean, if you're going to reflect current activity bills that are proposed, voting record, uh, and so forth, and do this with any scope, you know, beyond per perhaps, you know, a single market or a single region, um, you've got a lot of back-end activity that needs to be maintained on a constant basis. What are your thoughts about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so we can't do the databases ourselves. It just wouldn't be feasible, with the money and stuff. So we're gonna go to cloud computing with that. Um, Google has a really good one, but so does Amazon AWS. Um, they have a lot of stuff already in place and they can handle it uh, around the country to do that. And it usually it scales with the company. So say we're only in Philadelphia and we have 10,000 users. We're not paying $20,000 a month to use that. It's only for those 10,000. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about gathering data. Oh, the data. Well, that would just be from the sign up and then people inputting that. Um, you know, if someone presses yes on a poll, that's assigned to their profile. And we just have that data already stored in the database. Um, I can get into technology stuff, but it's a long, it's a long thing for that. But uh, it's just, yeah, it's, just simple, um, you know, they, they assigned to their, their thing and we have an entire um, collection of what their, their thoughts on certain things are and we'll, we'll be able to um, go through that um, and, you know, create the data that's actually meaningful and to a business per, per se, you know, readable. Mm -hmm. It's a good question though, because it's a hard, it's a hard uh, thing to overcome, definitely. Can you share how you plan on getting to that first 10,000 user base yeah sam do you want to take this question yeah sorry what was that like what are you getting the number yeah how are you get, going to get to ten thousand? yeah i mean we we want to uh go live with the app and then that's just one of our first milestone milestone goals and we think we can do that through um, our own community connections and then also marketing through you know linkedin twitter instagram etc and hopefully spread the word around you know my college connections colt's college connections Mm -hmm. uh, get close to 10,000 uh, before we go live actually would, would be the goal. So just through signups first. 
And then the main place also is the, you know, the mainstream media when you're on there and you're on Facebook seeing you're getting uh, annoyed by all these people's comments and stuff. And you just want to know if people agree or not. We'll have an ad on there that says, hey, you know, just get the facts here. And that's just strictly the facts from the get.gov site um, and nothing else. So mostly through marketing, through social media. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much, gentlemen. Next up is Chrissy from Philly Experiences. Great, hello, everyone. Let's see if I can get to my share my screen. I click present. Let's see. It says you can now see my screen. Hopefully, Canva is <laughs> listening. Come on, Canva. We got this. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Why is not allowing me to share the actual screen? I hit present and it's not. The purple present button. Say that one more time. Hit the purple present button. Come down. Come down. Oh, there's an, okay, it's behind the screen. Okay, I couldn't see that. All right, great. Hello, 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 hello. I am Chrissy, the founder and hood advocate of Philly Native, who founded Philly Experiences in 2018 a need not only in Philly, but around the world for visitors and locals to connect with both communities and businesses. The Philly Experiences was created to change the narrative of how you experience Philly. This idea to host my own tours bar crawls and game nights amongst plenty other experiences that I've tested in the market actually was solidified on the island of Wales. Four days into my solo, my first ever international solo travelers trip, um, when I was standing on the beach and I felt alone. And I wondered how come I can't find a way to connect with someone on the island that can take me to things that are non-touristy. I did not want to have the people that were on resorts, um, that were taking traditional tours. I wanted someone to take me to a bar that they would visit when they got off of work after working at the tourist agencies or working at the hotels and resorts or take me to Rihanna's house, honestly, and I still never made it. So the problem that, the opportunity that I saw um, after doing research is that this city is making billions of dollars every year and it's all concentrated in our downtown Philly area and not much of it is, is dispersed throughout the rest of the city. Um, 2019, 44 million visitors visited the city spending 7.6 billion. 39% of that was in recreation, which is where I come in. A Google search that I just did last night showed that 83 million people were searching for black businesses in Philadelphia. That's of course over the lifetime of Google, but those are the research, research, the research results that came up. And the increase in solo female travelers between 2015 and 17 has went up by 45%, which is my target audience. The problem. Authentic Black and LGBTQIA plus Philly culture is important to Black and LGBTQIA visitors who want to feel seen, heard, safe, and supported while visiting Philly. And the tourism that brings in billions is often concentrated in one area and is not 
really improving the, li the livelihood or the potholes in the city by being dis um, distributed anywhere else. And there's no easy way to find a trustworthy and reliable source of businesses and cultural experiences for visitors and locals. A solution. Hopefully it's playing straight through. That's a little slow, I'll keep moving. But half and full day community engagement experiences that bridges the gap between locals and visitors is super important in the city and that's where Philly Experiences has already tried and, trust and tested the market. And we have hundreds of satisfied customers, over 200 five-star reviews. And this year, day before my birthday, was featured in Travel Noir, which has over 640,000 IG followers. Um, which I thought was really, really dope. I cried, trust me. Um, and here is the customer persona. It's the black female, whether she's moving to the city or she's visiting as a travel nurse. Our partnerships can also benefit from getting in front of our customers. Competition, visit Philly, Airbnb host, and the mural arts program. We sell online. And I am my own team. The money would be used to hire a staff. Thank you. Judges, questions, comments. Great job, Chrissy. Uh, my question is, have you explored any partnership with Travel Noir or any sort of social media platforms that already have a built-in user base? No, that is where I, I tend to overthink of how to approach that. Um, the idea of partnerships, even sponsorships or fundraising is completely new. I've been bootstrapping since 2018, but Clubhouse has opened up my world to a lot of things. So I'm trying to figure that out. Chrissy, what what uh, exactly? I'm i really I, I think it's a very cool idea. What um, what do you charge for this? I mean, it, what what exactly does somebody book? I mean, do you are you acting as a tour guide and you sell this as a package? Uh, I'm I'm trying to understand exactly what the business model is here. Yes, I have been acting as an experienced curator. So if it's daytime, it's I have a very popular tour called Morals and Murals. And the rate is currently $44 a person. And I can host and have previously just recently hosted um, 21 guests at a time on SEPTA, which is very sustainable, just to get them to travel to cities like the local. Another popular experience is game night. So that's a nightlife experience. I've done bar crawls. And I also have a healing workshop that I was doing throughout the summer that I started in the pandemic. Um, so there's several experiences that can happen as, to, as me being the host, but I also want to expand so that other people can pitch ideas to me and I can be a resource for anybody coming to the city. Are, are you um, listed as, a, as an activity on something like uh, Travelocity or TripAdvisor or something like that? No, my original partnership was Airbnb Experiences, which I'm still there and it has worked well to allow me to test all of my ideas. Um, locally, I am listed on Discover PHL's website. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to think um, as you scale, like what's your kind of like your next couple milestones? Have you thought of that? Because you're, you're just you. Yeah. 
uh, how do we get more of you to make this available for more people? Uh, duplicating myself, I think it is possible. I have gotten a lot of questions asking people um, from people in other cities, how can they do this where they are? So being able to create a course, um, provide local training or some type of certificate program to make sure that they're actually fully experienced certified to train here, I would love to. I would love for the tours that I'm doing to be in every section of the city. I tried to recruit friends to do it. I'm still bugging a few people to do like vegan classes. Um, the city lacks a lot of parent and me um, experiences, which I think would take off. So um, there's plenty of opportunities, so many hats in so many directions that this can go, which I'm grateful for, but yes, it's just me. And I'm, and, and I'm a single parent. <laughs> So we'll see what happens. Oh, shout out to you for holding it down. Um, could you share a little bit of the revenue to date gained from those from that Airbnb, you know, platform and how that, um, you know, has been substantial, if at all? Gotcha. Um, no, in the beginning, it was very rough. Uh, using Airbnb's platform, I believe they took off faster than they, they should have. <laughs> so the suggestions that I've made along the way weren't really adhered to. And of course the pandemic, they had to completely shut down, which actually pushed me to, to build more locally, which has worked better than being on Airbnb's platform. To the point that my largest or my biggest um, sales was through Venture for America just two weeks ago where I was able to get um, two tours booked for $1,700, which I think is really, really dope. And since I've been launching and building everything on my actual Philly experiences.com, I've been able to bring in about $4,500 on my own. So I think I benefit being away from the platform more than on it, but I still care about the people coming to the city. So thank you. Good job, Chrissy. Come on, put your hands together for Chrissy. So next we have Jochi. 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 With the yes. Come on, let's go ahead and go. Can you guys hear me okay without the mic or do you need the mic? Uh, me, Joe, a 16 year old student who attends your traditional American high school. Now, Joe loves her academics, takes eight courses, including two advanced placement courses AP Chemistry and AP Art History. Like many others, Joe's student life doesn't end there. She gets involved with NUN, she's the varsity captain of her tennis team, and she's recently discovered a passion for journalism that she hopes to explore further. For the past week, Joe's been stressing out about her AP art history exam. Has been meeting to set up the time to meet with a teacher. And with a countless number of distractions, her sister, TikTok, her text from her friends, she's finding it hard to study and will discipline. So how does a sophomore in high school, a 16 year old student, oh my God, do all this? Here, this is a countless number of apps, subscriptions, books, and calendars, otherwise known as complete chaos. Hi guys, I'm Yash, I'm a second year student at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, not too long ago, I was in high school as well, and had a very similar experience to Joe. When it came to academics and understanding complex topics, our teachers supported us effortlessly. But it was my life outside of class that I struggled with managing. We were expected to excel inside class, get involved in extracurricular activities, and plan our futures. But the truth is, students in middle school and high school are given very little guidance on how to structure their lives outside of class in an organized and effective manner. As a result, students are not given exposure and tools to develop critical interpersonal skills, some of the most important years, and they end up stressed and overwhelmed. Meet Joji, an integrated personal management platform for students who go in high school, 
that caters to their school-related needs outside of class. So she seeks to create a less stressful and more meaningful schooling experience that equips schools with real-world life skills. So she enables students to better organize their time and workloads, schedule faculty and peer interactions, and facilitate extra activities while developing the and develop study skills. Now, what makes this different? Jochi is a student-friendly resource focused on making the Jochi experience as simple as possible for students. So now students, students don't need longer to have 100 different apps because we've consolidated all that as well. Our platform help, helps students by doing uh, Students are given the opportunity to build skills such as planning ahead, being proactive, metacognitive skills, and more effortlessly. Um, and the development of these organization and study skills will help them also excel within the classroom and academic. So our main focus is on students, but that being said, students are not the only ones who are going to benefit from this platform as teachers and admin will be able to access insights they've never seen before about their students' behavior outside of class. But why not? I'm currently a sophomore in high school and college, and I still have two more years. Why don't I wait two years and build this platform out there? Because the solution is needed more now than ever, and the market opportunity is at its all-time high. Furthermore, we're also leaving a very interesting time, COVID-19 where students around the world have missed out on over two years of normal education and development. But how do we know Jochi will move? Yeah, sorry. Jochi is the first integrated personal management system with a focus entirely on students, the first of its kind. As you can see above, there are tons of different apps out there, but none of them are student-friendly, what's the purpose, integrated, and actually focused like we are. So how do we know Jochi will succeed? What is Jochi's viability? Over the past six months, I was able to interview over 900 students through surveys and spoke to 20 plus teachers and admin. The majority of these conversations highlighted the need for Jochi. Um, furthermore, we're preparing for a pilot program early 2022 and are just about to start our search for schools. Um, already, the number one school in Pennsylvania, Madison High, and the American School of London, one of the most prestigious international schools, have uh, indicated interest. Um, throughout the development process of Jochi, uh, we want to make sure we're building the right product. So we worked with high school students um, and interns, and we got their insights throughout. With respect to IP, Joji hopes to make the most of its first market advantage and um, also talking to lawyers about copyright and IP stuff that I don't really know too much about. Um, and finally, a little bit more about me. Uh, yeah, I'm a sophomore. I'm studying systems engineering, but I'm also very passionate about entrepreneurship. Um, taking a bunch of classes in entrepreneurship, product design, design thinking, and I'm very involved in the entrepreneurship scene at Penn. I'm in the Ward Venture Lab, Ward Undergraduate Entrepreneurship Club. Um, and yeah, I launched the One Venture before, a graphic design agency that generated seven grand in less than a year. Um, and I also think that given that first hand experience of the problem I'm trying to solve, there's, <laughs> there's, um, yeah, there's no better, there's no founder better fit for the uh, position and myself. So yeah, please join me in uh, supporting students like Joe, see you outside the classroom and prepped to take on real worlds. Thank you. Could you walk us through um... The user experience journey, as you see it, whether it's from, um, yeah, I guess from from all ends, whichever users you're engaging on the platform. Yeah, so our main platform is for students. Um, that's what Jochi is. It's four features: the study, the planner, the meetings, and clubs. Um, it's very simple. We integrate with the school's existing systems, so their learning management systems. For from an admin side, it's very simple. All the all the students will see their their classes already on there. The teachers' availability. Um, for meetings, uh, so they can you know, easily plan their assignments and they don't have to re answer every single homework assignment, such as other apps like My Homework and other solutions, so existing solutions. Um, the teachers, they also have a small portal that they need to log on to just so that their calendar can stay up to date with Jochi. Um, very simple, it syncs right in. Um, yeah, and then from an admin perspective, there's nothing that they need to do after the initial integration. Uh, it's all managed by the super admin, so myself and my team. And they're provided by like we get to decide, but like probably twice a year, uh, insights about the general public student population, the usage of Jochi. Um, yeah. 
EdTech is not particularly my area of expertise, but I do know that the sales cycles are difficult and long. Could you talk to us about your go to market and plan to mon and exactly what the model is to monetize this? Yeah, so starting in January, so the winter term of high schools, we're going to start a pilot program. Um, because I'm an international student, I have to make the free pilot. Um, but after that pilot program, once we get that feedback, and we'll prepare for a market launch in fall of 2022 and use the summer to kind of build and fix um, and establish like an actual company that can operate in the US. Uh, it's going to be subscription based per student per month. After the initial, like initial uh, integration fee, depending on how big the school is and how many students they have, we're looking to secure those early customers to the pilot program, and then from there, uh, try to have uh, like long-term, long-term partnerships with these schools. Uh, targeting districts is probably going to be the smart suit because once you get a district, that you can kind of get access to all their schools uh, and private schools as well initially because they typically tend to have a lot more funding and. Uh, Budgets for current solutions at this. So I should look there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so then the payer from I, I'm not sure if I heard everything, but the customer is actually the student. It's not really the school. No. So the end user is the, uh, the student, and then the pay the actually yeah, the customer would be the technology like coordinator. Out of the school itself, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Because I, I, I actually was a teacher for two years. Um, and I know that some school already have something like that. Um, and a lot of the time they build, they like sort of build it themselves or, um, yeah, I guess maybe sim similar to what Scott is saying, like I'm just trying to understand the adoption. So I feel like um, at the teacher, a lot of the solutions you've probably seen are learning management systems, which are more focused on like homeworks, assignments, attendance. Um, but there's actually no, there's, yeah, there's no solution that's focused on the extracurricular side. So Joji is more focused on the student life outside of class in a non-academic sense. So that's like meeting to teachers, say a student's struggling with an assignment and wants to meet the teacher. That whole process is very overwhelming for like a 13 year old, 14 year old kid. It's very overwhelming for me as well, like back and forth, it's so inefficient. Um, a feature like, you know, you want to get involved with clubs. There's no, that's not a very organized process. Joe she kind of brings that all together. It's a catalog, you can filter through all the clubs and opportunity, opportunities available at your school. Um, the study portal lets you kind of, gives you a little space to study. Um, track your, your progress, log in, log out, so you can see your sessions, your study sessions, and see how you're improving over time, uh, just like those meditation apps do. Uh, to your point about the complexity, um, do you anticipate that you'll want to or that you should integrate this with the learning management systems? So it, is, it, is, it does integrate with the learning management system, so that the whole planner feature is very simple. So when a student logs in, all their assignments and all their classes are there. So all they really need to do is just kind of set the priority and they can view that all in an organized way. And then that goes straight to their calendar, to the Joji calendar, where they can see their meetings, their club activities, and yet when their assignments are viewed as well. But it doesn't serve as a portal to submit your assignments like a learning management system would do, because that's focused more on the, yeah, the academic side. Right, you know, coming in for a landing, our last two presenters, Samantha Carlin of Fit the Friends. Right. And the last person will be Kennedy of the Bob uh Lowry. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. I didn't see the time. Should I start going now? Okay, great. All right. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Carlin, and I am the founder of the Fit for Friends weight loss app, which provides a platform for users to compete in weight loss competitions with friends. So I developed the app after competing in a pre-wedding weight loss competition with my sister-in-laws. Um, and so I created an Excel spreadsheet and I would take everybody's weight every day um, and then it would spit out their percentage of weight loss and where they ranked in the competition. Um, and so after competing in this weight loss competition, it was a fun time. And then I looked on the app store and there really wasn't any other app that would facilitate competitions like this. So hence Fit for Friends was born. So looking at the problem of weight loss. According to the CDC, almost half of all Americans are trying to lose weight. Um, it's a timeless need, and because the act of eating is such a critical part of people's lives, weight loss is one of the hardest things to achieve. Uh, people try different weight loss plans and calorie counting, but often fail as the only person holding them accountable is themselves. So with Fit for Friends, we provide accountability in the form of competition, so we fill that need. And so some fast facts about the app. Um, in the app, users can connect with friends, create weight loss challenges, track their individual weight loss as pictured left, uh, which is really important because if they're not competing in a weight loss competition, they can still utilize the app. Um, and they're competing for the highest percentage of body weight loss, meaning that it's not pound for pound. So someone that is looking to lose five pounds um, can still compete against someone who's say looking to lose 20 pounds. Uh, the app was launched in September of 2020, and it's available on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Here are some additional screens of the app. So in the center, you'll see the main page. Um, here you'll see uh, all your challenge summaries. Um, so you have the Logan Losers, the Bridezillas. You can compete in a number of challenges at the same time. On your snapshot, it'll tell you where you rank in the competition, how many days you have left, your percentage of body weight. Um, and here you can share it on social media as well if you want to share um, your progress in a competition. Now, if you click on that uh, challenge snapshot, you'll be brought to the screen on the right. Uh, which is your uh, leaderboard. And so there you can see where you rank in the competition. Um, you can also see your percentage of body weight loss and how that compares against the average body weight lost of your group. So looking at the market as a whole, um, the fitness app market as a whole, um, you'll see that it's on an upward trajectory. Um, and one of the reasons behind that is just the increased demand uh, for continuous health assessment. Um, and especially with COVID now, uh, people are moving away from the gyms, um, working out on their own, but still looking for ways to connect with others. So Fit for Friends really fits that need. And looking at our, our demographic of the user base, we have a little over um, 800 users of our app. And of those users, mostly are female, 74% female, uh, mid to late 30s, and they're social. They're looking for ways to, to, to lose weight. They wanna lose weight with other people. And then this equates to a market size of opportunity of around 55 million. Um, and I got this number based off of the US census information for women in their 30s. Um, the statistic that I quoted earlier that almost half of all Americans are trying to lose weight and the premium user fee that we would charge. So looking at the, at the landscape, what else is out there? You have smart scales, you have other weight loss apps, you have wearables. Um, problems with smart scales are the app is secondary to the scale. Um, you have other weight loss apps that exist, but most are targeted at meal plans or calorie counting um, and don't really track your individual weight loss progress. And then the last, uh, you'll have wearables like the Fitbit, uh, which you have a Fitbit, you'll know that you can actually compete in competitions, but it's for daily steps and activity, not for actual weight loss. So what are people doing now? Uh, people are doing what I did with my Excel spreadsheet, uh, but often organized through Facebook groups where you would have an administrator where you would send your personal information to. Uh, but the downside is you're sending your personal information. Um, it's not tracking your individual weight loss and you're competing with strangers, which can be a downside um, for actual motivating you to, to lose weight. Um, our marketing plan post funding is both B2C and B2B um, through things like radio advertisements, Instagram influencers, and direct mailings, all to that target demographic that I just spoke about, the mid to late 30s female, and then B2B um, through marketing to businesses um, who offer health initiatives for their employees. The businesses would then market the app to their employees. Um, how we'll make money. Uh, one of the uh, features that I would like to develop with funding is the team challenge feature. And this would require an in-app upgrade of $4.99 to continue using the app. Um, and additionally, what I just spoke about with businesses, businesses that sign up for the app will be charged a premium.
and then acquisition. So this is our road to acquisition. Um, our current stage right now is growing our user base with funding we want to implement some of these additional features and then get acquired at the end. Um, and just wrapping up here, um, acquisition is very feasible in this space. You have Weight Watchers, which acquired a number of companies, and then you have um, additional uh, health and fitness apps uh, that were acquired as well, Under Armour, Adidas, Asics. Right now, I'm a sole entrepreneur. Um, I have a development team of independent contractors and interns. Um, and with funding, I would want to extend this team with a couple of developers, a director of sales that would do this outreach to businesses, like I said, and a director of marketing communication that would do outreach as well as the social media marketing and, and the B2C marketing. So thank you. I'll uh, start a great presentation, uh, Samantha. Um, how many users do you have right now? I know you're in beta. Yeah, 800 users. And are they paid or they're, they're all free? They're all free. You answered my other questions. <laughs> I had questions about uh, the availability of this kind of competition inside other apps like Fitbit and so forth, but you, you answered that, so. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, what are you planning on doing to monetize? Yeah, so right now it's free to download, free to use. If you download the app right now, you can only do individual challenges. So basically every man, woman for themselves in the challenges. A uh, feature that I want to implement is team-based challenges. So it could be you and I against another team and it would be our average percentage of body weight that would be calculated. Um, and then that feature would be an in-app upgrade. So you would upgrade for $4.99 for this team challenge feature. Um, so that's one way I want to monetize. And then the second way I want to monetize is by pitching this to businesses. Um, a lot of businesses have different health initiatives for their employees. Um, so the business would then uh, pay a premium, a yearly premium fee, and then offer this app for free then to their employees. So uh, both B2C and B2B uh, would be my marketing play there. Um, how would you pitch to, like, where would you find these B2B clients? Yeah, um, so one way to do that would be actually to pitch to insurance companies first. Um, a lot of insurance companies uh, work with uh, large organizations and within their health plans will have different fitness and health apps that they will offer at a discounted rate um, to businesses. Um, so for example, my husband works for Exelon. Um, we always get in the mail um, with his health plan uh, a, an app for back pain or, or whatnot. So the app was actually free to the employees of the company um, the, um, I just added discounted rates. The company is basically paying for the app and then offering it for free. So there are companies that I, I've been in the companies that offer Weight Watchers for us before. Okay. So with companies like that, then like how do you plan on, you know, having them use you versus Weight Watcher or something else? It would really have to be about numbers. So my play really here would be to um, hit the B2C market first before going B2B so I can show the numbers and the, the statistics and have the data at hand um, before presenting it to the insurance companies. Um, because the benefit to the insurance companies is, hey, is we're offering these different health initiatives to, um, to the businesses that are on our plans. If they have healthier employees, they're, they're not going to be having you know, as much surgeries or you know, medical costs. Do you anticipate that people would be on this for a long time or they would achieve their goal in their sort of short term and then you have a... Yeah, uh, great question. Um, my initial hypothesis was short term, uh, but what I've actually found from the 800 users that I have here um, is that the average amount that someone is looking to lose is not just five to 10 pounds. They're actually looking to lose around 50 plus pounds. Um, and because of that, they're repeat customers. And so what I've seen here with the data that I have so far are that people are doing multiple challenges. So repeats. Thank you. Um, have you sort of experimented or like pilot your test on if, if people would adopt that pricing for the team challenge? And and yeah, like survey that you've done, like this is actually something that the users would want. 
Right, right. So I, I would need to actually kind of test that price point, I think. Um, I've gotten feedback just from users of the app for just that feature to be built. So I've gotten that request. Um, the $4.99 is what I've looked at with other apps in the market. Um, it seems to be a slightly discounted rate from what other fitness apps require. Um, you know, for example, even I'm sure you've seen commercials for Noom. Um, that's around like $30 to $40 just a month for that subscription. Um, so this is a pretty discounted rate just a one-time fee um, just for the team challenge feature. So it would it would definitely need to be tested in the market, but I definitely have gotten received feedback that people want that feature. Do you have a sense of your churn rate for your existing users? Um, so I'm just saying return rate or churn rate? Sorry, churn rate. Return rate. Um, right now, I mean, people have just continually done competitions, which was surprising to me. So they will finish a competition and then in the next week or so continue with their next competition. So it seems like this continuous plan. Um, initially, my hypo hypothesis was that they would be maybe uh, do a competition for a month, but these competitions on average last around three months. So it's pretty much a, a yearly, um, you know, a yearly thing that these uh, people are sticking with it. Last and certainly not least is a lottery with K. Hi, everyone. Good evening. So I'm going to um, share my screen. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Hi again, um, my name is Kenya Yafara. I am the co-founder and CEO of Elari Tiger Root, Root Milk. Elari is um, an Elton wellness brand we believe in ingredients that replenish the planet and provide functional nutrition to our consumer. So essentially better for the people and better for the planet. Okay. The current pain point of um, plant-based milk users is that plant-based milk is often over-processed. They are not focusing on gut health and immune system and they use oils, sugars, and artificial gums, which are not necessarily good for the people or good for the planet. The current opportunities in the space in the plant-based product is that the milk category alone is a 2.5 billion category with double digit growth. In my household personally, we have completely transitioned from dairy to plant-based milk. So these numbers are not, these numbers are, are basic facts of the world we live in right now. And also, not only that, Oatly had a billion dollar um, IPO this, earlier this year. Calofia Farms, Notco, and Ripple Foods are all raising money, all in the plant-based milk category. There's certainly enough innovation in the category. There's a lot of innovations in the use of seeds and different ingredients. There's also innovations in particular ingredients and focusing on functional nutrition, like um, in case of um, um, Ripple, focusing on proteins, and also in Take Two and Good Milk, they are doing sustainability. However, meet Elari. At Elari, we are encompassing all three frontiers. We are, we are not free, dairy free. Our era ingredient, the tiger nut, is sustainably grown. It's a cover crop. And we come in three delicious skews. Nothing is added. We have vanilla, original, and the barrister for food service and coffee lovers. Our, we, in this space, we, we are definitely on trend and our first mover advantage because there's no one currently doing tiger nut root milk. Our, um, our consumer, we, our target consumer is called the, we've dubbed the inspired and virtual, is already in the plant-based milk space. They already drink plant-based. They love to experiment. They are passionate about cooking and uh, um, keeping active. 
we are talk our consumer is racially diverse and small families with small kids that prefer quality over price. Our go-to market strategy is a focused only channel one. We're doing a distribution channel to brick and model still, um, brick and model stores direct to consumer from our website and also food service. Based on this, we are planning a soft launch in, early, in the um, early 2022 with a soft launch with one key distributor and some independent stores. We start with about 50 stores and the plan is to gradually and organically grow. And we are projecting by our fourth or fifth year in business to have a to be at least in about 70, in about 7,000 stores with Costco and the big, the, um, the big players. Based on this sales projection, our, um, based on the sales strategy, our projection is that by a full year of business in 2020, we should have about $174,000 in revenue. Although we will not be a bit of positive, but we know based on the plan, that by our fifth year in business, we should be a $18 million revenue business. And this data is based, it's, it's a very conservative one case, which is a six unit pack per store per, per month. And by our um, five and uh, fifth year, we believe we will be definitely a bit positive. The team that's gonna be working on this is myself, um, as a co-founder, I am a software developer. I have a lot of experience in information technology space. I know every business is a technology business and I understand that space. My husband is the chief strategy, he is also an investment portfolio manager. He knows what a financially sound company needs to look like on paper and how to get us there. And quite recently, actually today, we signed with, um, Professor George Latella from um, St. Joe's University. So he's going to be a VP of sales and marketing. So the plan that I've shown you so far is going to be the aid and the spare to implement that plan, the financials. So for this um, sales strategy, we believe we would need about a million to a million and a half of funding for our first 12 to 18 months of runway. The first, the first third of this money is going to go into the marketing and sales strategy into implementing them. And the next third would go into building the team that will be pounding the pavement and selling in Larry. The last third of the required funding is going to be a combination of the initial inventory build and working capital for that runway. Thank you, and um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for your time. Um, so I looked online, I see that there are other tiger nut milk, so. Um, so you, the, what you see online, what you would find online would be um, tiger nut with something else. It wouldn't be tiger nut as the main ingredient because tiger nut is usually consumed as an ochata. So it could be tiger nut with rice milk or something else. But we are totally just tiger nut. We want to highlight our hero ingredient, which is the tiger nut. Okay, got it. And, and what's the price point? So for the price point, we are thinking our bottle is going to come in at 32 ounce and the price point is $5.99. <laughs> And then your, your, your margin would be roughly how much and at what scale? So our margin um, initially, we are projecting is gonna be about 25%, but as we, as we scale, we think we can get that to up to about 35 and um, about 35 to 40 range. Uh, I'll let the other judges ask questions. Sorry, I thought I thought Scott was jumping in. Um, <laughs> could you walk us through your your 
timeline again, uh, especially for you know the next, let's say the next 12 months? So the next 12 months. So what we want, initially the plan was to launch this quarter, but um, one of the choke point in um, all dairy is um, co-packing and getting a manufacturer. That's been a, it's a huge choke point for everybody, including Oatly. So we couldn't meet that deadline, but the plan now is we would launch in 2022. So 2022 would be our full year in business. And we're going to, it's going to be a phased approach. We would start with about 50 stores and just test out the strategy, test out the market, get feedback. And um, we're starting along the coast because we know that our, our, our target consumer lives along the coast. So East Coast or West Coast. Currently, our, um, our core packet that we've been able to secure is on the West Coast. So we're starting on the West Coast and expand regionally. Kenny, do you anticipate a significant educational challenge? I mean, it's kind of easy for me to understand almond milk, or it, it's not as easy for me to understand tiger nut milk. I, I have no familiarity with it. I've never heard of it before. So how much of what you need to do from a marketing standpoint is really education? Well, that's absolutely correct. So um, for us, the, there's two orders is we not only do we have to educate a consumer about tiger nut, we also we've found in our in our consumer research is that there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace. So what we have done is on our packaging. I'm not sure if you guys could see it. We're going to implement QR code strategy. So you could go to our website. So on the packaging itself, we're using QR code to um, educate. And um, there's going to be a call to action, learn more about the tiger knot. And that um, content will make sure it's fresh and dynamic to get just to get people educated. We definitely know that we have to educate the populace about tiger knot and not only about tiger knot, but the um, nutritional impact and the benefits of the tiger knot roots. I think, I think if it tastes great and then you go to um, know where your clients are, they're all like, they would just- Yeah, that, that's the other thing. That's why on the packaging, we're emphasizing on the taste, on the creaminess, on what it looks like. That um, So we know that we have, because I mean, I was just at Expo East and what I found is that, yes, there's no sugar in all of that stuff. There's, it's good for you. But the taste factor still needs to be overcome. Like this, it still doesn't taste. I tasted flaxseed milk. Personally, I didn't like it because I don't think it tasted good. Like it doesn't taste familiar. But the good, good thing about tiger nut is it's an Asian nut. So it's, there's almost a familiarity to it. Although you've never tried it, but everyone that's tried it has always been like, it's, it tastes familiar. Like, I don't know what it is, but like there's a familiarity to it. How difficult is it for someone else to just like want to take off? Because um, it's the same thing as oat milk. I drank it the first time in West Coast. And then like after I came back somehow, like every store, had, like there's sold many different brands with oat milk. Yeah, so that's another thing. In our production, um, in our production um, development, when we wanted to go to market with this, we realize that we have a patentable process and that is what we're, we're working towards that. We're working, our research and development is a lab out of um, North Carolina State. So we are working with them to get a patent in place so we can secure that. Um, I guess I could ask one more question. Like you, you mentioned 50 stores, like do you already have them? Like you already have connection to them or you So just... right now we are pre-market, we are pre-launch. We, we are not in the market right now, but right. we are, we're, yeah. I guess like, do you have connections or like strategy of how to reach them? Yes, exactly. That's where George comes in. George is not only a professor at um, St. Joe's University, he, was, he works. He works in that. He works in that. Um, he works in the industry. He has a lot of industry contact. So we we're, we're, um, we just closed a deal with him today, actually, to um, help us implement our sales plan. 
Thank you. All right. So, thank you. So, all right, we're going to uh, put our judges into a breakout room that they might deliberate and uh, come up with some winners. And the answer is my esteemed honor to introduce Ms. Tracy Palala to talk to you folks. Thank you. I'm going to grab one of these chairs. Um, but before you leave, are you going to deliberate or not? Okay. okay. Well, thank you, Tanya. Um, cohort two for Long Ramp was an amazing success. Um, thanks for your leadership and just kind of reimagining this program the second time around. And so the feedback has been incredible. So thank you very much. All right, is this a good angle? Can you see me? Since I know everybody else is talking. All right, and I'm officially old. This is my first time here with glasses on, so I could actually see the screen. So, in true transparency. Um, so, uh, Clover 2 was fabulous. I think at the end of the day, there were 36 folks who participated. Um, it's really exciting to see the diversity of the products. So the time now while the judges are deliberating is just going to be a little bit of time um, to get some of your feedback so we can find out who your fan favorites were. So some voting from all of you. Um, and then if there's specific feedback that you had or questions that you had for the individual presenters, I'd love to take some time to do that as well because, you know, there's the people on the screen who are the official judges, but at the end of the day, all of your feedback is incredibly important. Um, and insightful. Um, and then I will also mention that um, we will put up in the chat that the Science Center is actually supporting a new platform called Eureka. And Eureka is an online platform for entrepreneurs um, that it's a year platform where you kind of have an opportunity to get one on one feedback from a mentor group. So um, we'll put that information in the chat for folks to see, but we're really excited about it. Applications literally just went up like while I was sitting in this room. So in the last half an hour, we're asking folks to apply um, in the next um, couple weeks. Um, I think the date. Uh, and it closes is around October 12th. Kind of all of the formal communication around this will come out, but really gives you an opportunity. The Science Center is doing like 10 scholarships to this platform, and it gives folks an opportunity for continued ongoing relationships. And we're really focused on uh, helping underrepresented matters in the Philadelphia area. So I will stop for a second and ask Emily if she can help me. Um, put the mentee information in um, the chat. So, um, folks, um, the first question is, which startup gave the best presentation? So if you have a phone, can they vote? We go to mentee.com and they put it in front of us. That long, long code? <laughs> <laughs> that long code. <laughs> <laughs> We do need a QR code up on the screen. So folks, um, online it's probably going to be easier. I mean, you can do a, a, a do a shout out depending upon what happens. Here from a poll for folks in the room if it is impossible to get to. I am Facebook poll. <laughs> yeah, that answer is coming in. <laughs> Oh, there's some bias there. Lots of the uh, cohort one, we did this as well. So it was really interesting to see um, kind of how kind of the folks in the room voted versus the, the panel of judges. It was um, really close. Just a couple more minutes. No, 
That's interesting. That is, that would be interesting, the, the breakout between inline and on person. Folks, I can see folks in the room. Most folks seem to have their cell phone done, so I'm assuming that means folks have voted. Um, folks on the line want to make sure that you all feel included as well. Um, it looks like um, there was a resounding um, vote for fit for friends. I'm um, surprised that, every, that everyone doesn't have at least one vote. Um, so the next were Ms. Moo and Philly Experiences. So that's awesome. Ellen, do you want to move on to the second one? So which startup presented the best concept? So maybe the presentation, you know, could be worked on a little bit, but like conceptually, we're like, yeah, I get this. I believe in this idea. Tracy, do you think when people are seeing the results in the testing? Biasing them? I was, I, was, I was thinking that there could be some bias there. I'm like, um, I was definitely thinking that as well. Next time we won't do the free version, maybe we'll do, we'll do the paid version so we have you know, opportunities to you know, input into how it goes. Wow, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, variety in, in this particular result. Give it a couple seconds. I think we had 12 votes on the last one, so we'll see what we get to. Personally, was not privy to the judging criteria, so I'm not sure what the judges are based on. But I love um, the diversity that we're seeing from kind of presentation versus concept. And like conceptually, I completely agree with what's here that there were some really, really interesting concepts. And yet, um, so working on the presentation, despite the fact that it's hard, is actually the easy part. The concept is the hard part. So. Um, so really politic and um, Josie were kind of the two here that were really kind of rising to the top from a concept standpoint. Um, anyone want to talk a little bit about what they liked about the concept, um, you know, of any of these in particular, but what stood out for you of any of the businesses particular concepts? And folks online, feel free to jump in as well. Doesn't have to be folks in the room. Probably. I think for me, when I'm thinking about a concept, I'm most impressed by people who really understand who their target audience is. And a lot of times when you yourself have either experienced that problem or have seen that in your network, that tends to be the best concepts because you can tell they've happen organically. It's not just like, oh, I want to do something cool. It's, I, I've seen this and I want to create something that is specifically impressive. I love that idea. Any other thoughts kind of conceptually? Yeah, for uh, politics, for the politics, uh, politics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did the oh, same yeah. thing too. I was hard. Your logo was hard for me, whether it was two L's or one L, just oh, as yeah. just as an FYI. So. <laughs> so uh, for politics, I like it because I can see something I use myself and have everything in one place. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. So I was curious about so, so the, the the first part of the pitch is interesting because like we wanted to present facts, right? So you can just go one slide, get facts, and then. Of course, some people are going to be like, I don't know that your facts are right, but the, it seems pretty straightforward until you mention summaries of bills, right? Because you can summarize a bill and lead someone in a different direction. I've seen an example on where you word a, I uh, can't think of the term right now, but when you, when you go and you vote on a, on a public measure and they, it can be summarized and then read later that you just voted for something that almost completely the opposite. So, how, like, how do you think of handling the summary part? Yeah, so the summary, summaries of bills, you can also. Thank you for your question. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so the summary of bills, you can also um, create something on as well, which is separate from our institutional politician. But um, what we're going to do is we're going to use the DACA sites and then try to just include what was numerically done, the like tax information, as well as include um, not really highlights. We're also going to have a list of things that are the entire if they want, but usually bills um, generally include like important measures that they take. And so, what we want to do is create like a, you know, a summary of essentially without anything else. We need to the bill actually accomplish it. So, but like the idea of the office. In July. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, well, I am still going to ask another question. Um, despite the fact that it looks like our judges have returned, which was amazing. Um, so my question for all of you, and I love the folks online as well, to tell me what was the best part of your on-ramp experience? So was it a particular um, session, um, particular speaker? Was it the community? Tell me a little bit about what was the best part of your on-ramp experience. So I'm just gonna draw this out so you all have some more suspense. <laughs> All right, and then I'll. <laughs> I thought um, my favorite part was really interacting with, with all of you and everyone else on the in the program and seeing hear what everyone else is doing and what they're talking about and, uh, and of course Tanya as well. Everybody is doing in the room with us all. You know, every week, week after week. So as well for me, I thought the sessions where there was a interactive component were particularly helpful because it made you pay attention in a different way, engaged me in a different way. So I can't remember the details right now, but a couple of times or so we broke out and had to talk in a small group, or we had to we practice elevator pitches, and it's like okay, then, then I'm not just listening, I'm participating, I have to engage and think, and I think those are those are particularly effective parts. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I thought it was cool, like, um, learning every week how much I didn't know. <laughs> and, and, like, go, like going, like, thinking about it afterwards and being like, wow, like, that's actually going to help a lot in the long run. And I like, think it was also cool to even see her with it. Awesome. Well, without further ado, is there anyone online real quick that, oh, Carl, I see Carl's hand raised. I'm not sure if that's recent. <laughs> Carl, do you want to unmute or type it in the chat, maybe? All right, well, I'm going to do the drum roll and hand this over to Ms. Tanya Morris, founder and resident of Cohort 2 Extraordinaire. <laughs> Okay, here we go. All right. Um, again, I want to thank you all so much, all of our participants, every business. And I didn't thank our instructors uh, that were part of as well. So many of them are on Ben uh, from Uncommon Individuals, um, Jeff from USCFO, um, uh, Sharice, um, so many of our instructors that were absolutely incredible. I totally forgot to thank all of them this morning, but they were really our, our part of this, of this success here and these amazing uh, businesses, all of which are absolutely incredible, all of which I'm excited, excited about, I can't more excited about them uh, today. So, let's do a little drum roll. So, I'll do one more time. Third place winner of fifteen hundred dollars is Samantha. And, and, and oh yes, you I'm telling you Come on, Angela, because I'm not gonna get that all right. So yeah. <laughs> Angela and I did at the time I'm working out with Angela to wait her. And she's a hard taskmaster, but she's <laughs> <laughs> They're hard tasks. Just keep ready. I'm just stuck. 
So what is it again? What are all we getting? So you get fifteen hundred dollars. You get a mentorship connect membership at tax, and you get a membership at IC at thirty four one. Nice. And you can also get some AWS credits from um, your business as well. So I forgot about that one. So our uh, third place one is Samantha Carlin, uh, Fit for Friends. Second place is Philly Experiences. <laughs> $2,500 and all that other stuff that we're talking about. And the last place is the last place. The last place. The first place, which is $5,000 and all that other stuff that we're talking about, is a Lowry and Kitty. Oh my God. Excuse, did you say a Lowry? Yes. <laughs> yes, I did, Kitty. Yes. Oh my God. Thank you. Oh my God. Where you at? Are you on camera? Come on, camera so we can see. Thank you. 